at least what I saw was that um, people's workflows kind of shifted when they realized that um, they could use this a little bit more like a scalpel, right, instead of a, a sledgehammer. So if you've got the ability to go in and do sort of targeted delivery to um, to only the things that, that you care about, then um, that changes your workflow. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. This is a conversation with Chris Padwick, who is Director of Computer Vision and Machine Learning at Blue River, which is a company acquired by John Deere that helps farmers strategically spray pesticides and herbicides to help the environment and help their customers. It's a super cool application of machine learning because it's so concrete and so unambiguously great for the world, but also super difficult. They run into kind of every edge case you can possibly imagine. And it's really fun to talk to someone that's spent so much time working on a single hard problem. Chris, thanks for doing this. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me, Lucas. This is going to be a lot of fun. Awesome. You work on some of my favorite ML applications. So I'd, I'd love to maybe start with an explanation of, of what you're working on at John Deere. Yeah, absolutely. So one of our products that we're working on with John Deere is called uh, Sea and Spray. And uh, the idea is really interesting. So when a, if you look at how a farmer does their, does their workflow right now, there's, there's a bunch of, you know, parts to farming, right? If you think of it as a, a software stack, you know, you can describe it as uh, there's a, a tillage portion of that where you're preparing the soil, then you're planting the soil, then you're um, weeding the soil or you're weeding the plants and then you're harvesting. There's kind of like those four sections. Sea and Spray targets the, uh, the weeding section where what we've done is taken uh, an existing sprayer that, uh, that folks have. And these are huge machines, actually. Uh, they have a 120 foot spray boom and they're capable of, uh, you know, upwards of 800 acres a day in weeding. So these, these things are, you know, I'm, I'm six foot two and, uh, this machine, when I stand beside the uh, wheel, it's, uh, you know, it's the wheel is taller than my head, right? So this is a giant, you know, giant, giant machine. And it can do uh, tremendous amounts of uh, productivity is what is what people buy this for. And so the application that we're targeting is instead of uh, spraying your entire field to kill the weeds, you really only need to spray the weeds. And that's what we built. So we built a computer vision system with AI and specifically deep learning that uh, does discrimination between crop and weed, and then a robotic system around that that only targets the weeds. And so is this something that gets like pulled behind a tractor? Like what does this machine actually look like? Yeah, this is um, this is a, an existing product called a self-propelled sprayer, and it's really a purpose-built device. And so um, I'll do a little impression of it for you. I should have brought a little toy. But um, <laughs> What happens is the uh, it has these spray booms, and I, I'm actually not flexible enough to do it, but imagine my elbows are pointing exactly forward. And then when we unfurl the boom, they uh, you know these these booms go go out and they're sixty feet on each side. And uh, then we have uh, 98, 98 nozzles actually spaced throughout the boom. And as the farmer goes through the field, uh, what happens is the cameras, we, we, have, we have cameras basically spaced uh, roughly every meter. And cameras take pictures as you go through the field. Those pictures go into a machine learning algorithm that we've trained to distinguish uh, crop from weed. Uh, and that's a convolutional neural network using, uh, you know, deep learning. Um, and then, you know, we map those to individual sprayer locations and then try to only spray the weed uh, as we're going over it. Um, wow. So you have like, did, did you say you have like 120 cameras then that, that unfurl or something like that? Am I doing it's a 120 right? foot boom. And uh, on, on one of our configurations, we've got 36 cameras. Oh, one every over, meter. Uh, I see. Yeah, that's right. Gotcha. Yeah. And and so then, but then the sprayers are actually at a at a smaller interval than that. Are, is like each one over each, like one row of crops or are there like multiple, how, how does that work? Yeah, that's, that's right. So there's different kind of configurations. Um, uh, it, it's kind of dictated by what the farmer is doing with the machine. So um, in, we, we do row crops right now. So three, three uh, target crops, there's uh, soybean and cotton and corn. 
And depending where you are in the, you know, in, in the U.S., uh, you might grow, if you're in Texas, you might grow cotton at sort of 40 inch rows, uh, in which case you'd sort of take a 20 inch uh, machine where uh, you, you'd have a sprayer every 20 inches. So you're, you're spraying, you know, if you kind of measure, like imagine the two rows and they're 40 inches apart, you've got a sprayer there and then a sprayer on the row. Um, the other common one is 30 inch, uh, which is uh, found a little bit more in the in the Midwest rather than the South. And so the cameras are kind of pointed down at the crops, and I guess the cameras are in front of the sprayers, so they know when the weeds are coming. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So our um, our geometry is that we we actually have a camera that's that's tilted forward, um, so that we can see the crops and then react to them. Um, we did try to. Uh, the, the kind of like the most ideal geometry is in a side view is if you have a something sticking out and then the the camera pointing straight down but unfortunately uh, anything that sticks out of the boom is something that will probably get torn off um, when it hits something and so I don't know if you've ever driven something that has like a 60 foot thing sticking out of it on each side it's uh it's really really hard not to hit stuff and and actually, uh, so that was one of our design constraints is that we, we really couldn't, we could put things that come up from the boom cause those are safer, but we couldn't put things that, uh, that go out, you know, out from the boom. Cause that would be a, like a mechanical, uh, risk that, that we would just end up breaking parts and breaking the sprayer. And so uh, what's, what's the, ben- the benefit here to the farmers that they use less, I guess, what do you call it? What, what do you even call the thing that kills the weeds? Like herbicide? Yeah, herbicide. Yeah. Yeah, that's one of the big benefits. So um, I'll, I'll kind of like put this problem into perspective for you and and give you uh, try to give you a little bit of an understanding uh, as, as to why, you know, farmers are so excited by this product. So it, let's sort of take an example and say that you're a, a 5,000 acre cotton farmer. So you've got a, you know, 5,000 acres total, maybe spread over multiple fields. And the amount of money that you're going to spend just on herbicides. So it, we, we actually call this kind of like the inputs. And, and so your inputs are, you know, fuel for your, for your sprayer. Maybe you have to buy a new sprayer. That could be an input, you know, depreciation costs that could be an input, but seed costs and also herbicide are one of your, you know, really main cost drivers. And so just in terms of the herbicide, you could be spending up to like, it wouldn't be uncommon to spend one hundred fifty thousand um, dollars, you know, spraying herbicide on your field. So, if I come to you with a with a tool like this, the seed and spray system, which is more of a targeted system, and say, hey, you know, depending on your weed pressure and depending on your farming practices, depending on you know a, a few input variables, we actually might be able to save you a lot of money there. Um, and maybe you only have to spray 50% or maybe 70% or, you know, maybe 30%, right? It, it depends on a lot of factors. But if I could put a dent in that herbicide cost for you, then that's a really interesting uh, proposition because that's, you know, money that you can reinvest in your farm and you can, uh, you can do something else with that money rather than uh, spray herbicide. So that's one of the biggest uh, uh, cost drivers for the farmer. Um, the second kind of cost driver or the, the second driver is um, wanting to uh, be uh, more sustainable, like participate in more sustainable farming practices. And that's a big, uh, you know, that's that's on a lot of farmers' minds of uh, trying to spray, you know, less herbicide and be better stewards of the land. And, and this product goes, uh, you know, goes directly into that use case. So uh, folks are very excited by, by those two things. Uh, and, and that's kind of like the main... Uh, main value propositions for the product. That's super cool. Um, and does it have to then do the inference on computers that live on this device? Like, do you, do you actually put like, um, like a whole bunch of computers to process all these images? How, how does that work? Yeah, it, it, that's exactly right. So we've built some custom electronics around, with, with John Deere, uh, that will survive in the agricultural environment. So, um, it's sort of funny, you know, when we think about like, okay, where would you put a cluster of computers? And 
probably like your last choice would be uh, in Texas in 115 degree Fahrenheit heat with lots of dust, right? Like that's that's kind of like not the thing that comes to mind when you're building clusters of computers. Um, but that's actually like exactly what we've done. So we have uh, in the current design, we have these compute units uh, on a machine and they they function in you know literally like the worst environment you can imagine, uh, and uh, it takes a lot of engineering to make that work. But yeah, we um, you when we first kind of described this workflow to to people, they sort of think, oh, so you're like you're pushing stuff up to the cloud and doing the inference and sending result back. And actually we're doing it all on board, um, just like an auto driving car, because we just don't have the time. We, you know, we don't have the latency to be able to do that. We need to make decisions. Uh, as soon as we see the weed, we have to react within milliseconds. Or so it's all done. Uh, yeah, it's all done on the, uh, on the platform. And is this a hard vision problem? Like, like, just to get the accuracy to what you need, is that a big challenge for you? Yeah, it really has been a hard uh, vision problem. So there's sort of two types of products that we that we talk about. Um, one of them's uh, called a green on brown product, and that's out in the market today. It's marketed as uh, Sea and Spray Select. So that's a uh, that's a uh, computer vision based uh, uh, AI system that is capable of spraying. Um, uh, weeds that are in the furrow. So if you, if you think of a row crop, you've got like the, the two rows here and like the furrow in the middle. So this product can spray weeds that are in the furrow. And the next level of that product is the green on green product, where now you can say, okay, well, I can tell the difference between a, a weed uh, and a crop, even if it's in the furrow, because you know your weed can then kind of grow anywhere. It does, it's not only uh, it's not only constrained to just like anyone who has a garden, right? You know that weeds <laughs> will grow wherever they want, and uh, they're not constrained to just grow in the furrow. So the green on green product is is sort of the next level of the of the capability and um, it's a really hard vision problem. One of the things that makes it really hard is that uh, it's tough to get labels that are correct for these. So uh, I don't know about you, but it's tough for me to tell the difference between, you know, say a, a pigweed and a cotton plant that's a certain uh, certain size, uh, or a velvet leaf, uh, you know, or a morning glory. Right? These are these are weeds that look a lot like uh, maybe a cotton plant or maybe a soybean plant at a certain time of its life. And in order for our product to be successful, our labels on the on that data have to, you know have to be correct. And uh, what we've kind of found uh, you know through uh, trial and error is that uh, it's pretty easy to find people that label um, you know label images for you, but it's actually really, really tough to find people that know the difference between uh, these kinds of weeds and, and these crops. And so that's been kind of our main challenge on this project is uh, assembling uh, what I would call, a, you know, an expert workforce of uh, agronomists, actually, who have, you know, some of them actually, actually have PhD in weed science. And these folks help us develop training materials and help us uh, tell the difference between, uh, you know, these different varieties of crop and weed. And uh, that, yeah, that's really, really important as we, we look at our pipeline and our stack. That's kind of like the, the thing that we spend probably the most time on is, is talking about label quality and how to improve it and how to measure it. So yeah, it's a huge, huge topic for us. And is, is that partially because have weeds evolved to look like plants so that human farmers don't pull them up? There's some truth to that. Yeah. Um, I think there's, uh, my, I'm going to repeat a story that my agronomist told me that there's a, um, there's a weed, uh, the kind of like, uh, what's called a, minim a mimic reed weed in, uh, in rice. And what happened is when people started hand weeding rice, um, all of a sudden, they, it was sort of a selective process where things that didn't look like rice got weeded out, but things that did look like rice started to survive. And so this mimic weed kind of evolved and it sort of came to the point that it looked so much like uh, rice while it was growing that a, a sort of trained person in the field had a roughly 70% chance of, you know, 
telling whether it was rice or not, right? So that's mm-hmm. that's like how wow. good the mimicry had gotten. Um, <laughs> and uh, we definitely do see that in in our models too. So we we have a, um, you know, we don't officially call it like the FBI's most wanted list, but uh, maybe we should call it that. But we do have, yeah, some weeds that are, are much more challenging to differentiate. Um, and they, they look a lot like, you know, sometimes we have arguments on the CVML team, like, okay, well, what do we think this is, right? And it, it, some of these cases are pretty ambiguous. <laughs> I guess if you know where you planted the plants, though, couldn't you say that any plant that's sort of not in the place where you think you planted a plant is a weed or, or should be sprayed? Or what, why do you need to identify exactly what kind of plant it is? Oh yeah, that's a really good question. There's kind of two two answers to that question. So answer number one is that uh, you certainly can, uh, you know, you, you do have that information, especially if you're using a John Deere uh, planting stack, like a, I was talking about the farming stack. If you're if you've got sort of John Deere uh, machines at every part of that stack, then you've got information about everything you've done. So like specifically with uh, with um, Exact Emerge, it's a technology for planting where you can actually tell you know, precisely where the seeds um, were uh, planted. Um, now, the thing that you don't know is what's emerged. So you do know like what was planted, but you don't really have a good sense of what's emerged. And so that's that's one reason that you do have to do kind of a vision based uh, approach to this. I see. The second, um, yeah, the the second one uh, reason is. Uh, is actually a, a really kind of a subtle one. Um, so when we're talking about herbicides, you know, it, it's funny, like when I started at Blue River, I thought that, oh, like killing plants is easy. You just spray a herbicide on them and they die, right? And it's actually very, very complicated. And uh, one of the things that's that's most interesting here is that um, you've, you've kind of got like two, two species, uh, you know, r- rough kind of breakdowns of plants. You got broadleaf and grasses, and you actually use different herbicides to go go after broadleaf versus grasses. So if I can tell you with my machine learning model that, you know, okay, this is a weed and it's a broadleaf weed, then you're going to put something different in your tank mix to actually attack that weed. And if you have a, similarly, if you have a grass weed, like if you try to spray a broadleaf herbicide on your grass weed, it's not going to do anything. So there's the opportunity there for um, for more savings for the customer and more effective weed control by uh, identifying, you know, in roughly kind of are we dealing with uh, broadleaf or grass, and then targeting the the seed and spray, you know, is targeting the herbicides uh, directly to the plant that needs them. I see. That's very cool. Um, so how how deployed is this? Like, if I went to fields in Texas, would I see this device in use? Yeah, um, if you had been uh, in our field season, so our, our, I guess our field season's still technically going. Um, we're into what we call fallow operations right now, which is uh, um, basically identify any plants that are in a fallow field and spray them. Um, but between the the sort of the uh, uh, months of uh, you know roughly March uh, March to say August, that that was kind of our main. Um, main we, uh, weeding season for uh, soy and cotton and corn. And if you had come to uh, Texas and the Midwest and uh, that area of the U.S., then yeah, you would have seen this system deployed. And we did something really uh, kind of a first for Blue River uh, uh, this this past year. Um, so in, in previous years, what we'd done is we'd, we'd built some, you know, a machine and then we'd taken it to a grower's field, gotten a cooperating grower, and then we'd operated the machine and kind of done demos, you know, to get product feedback. And that worked really well, but it's not the same as a customer actually operating machine. So this year, what we did is we actually handed the keys over um, with, a, you know, this brand new sprayer that's right off the line, has all the bells and whistles and a bunch of uh, brand new technology. We handed them to uh, growers and said, uh, you, you know, he gave him a little lesson on how to run it and said, you know, you, you actually run this machine and, and we're going to, we're just going to sit on the, on the road <laughs> and kind of watch you do it. And we're not going to interfere with you. Um, and so, yeah, we actually 
did give customers the you know the ability to uh, to run the machine and uh, just the le- the learnings from that were really great. So we're actually just sort of still compiling the learnings and and uh, bubbling the uh, the biggest things that we want to work on up to the top so we can uh, hit the ground running again next year. Wow, were there any surprises when you did that? Yeah, yeah, big time. So um, there was one that I think is is really funny. So, um, you know, on, on CVML, like uh, computer vision machine learning, we, we tend to look at the world in, in a certain way. And that way is like, okay, the most important thing for the machine to do is identify the weed and then spray the weed. And, you know, there's a pretty good reason for that because, uh, you know, what happens to a small weed? Well, it turns into a big weed and that becomes a problem. So hitting weeds when they're small is a uh, is something that you know we we think we need to work on. So we worked on on that problem um, very diligently, and we've got a solution that that definitely targets the smallest weeds. So we do this with a little sensitivity knob um, on the model, and and what it's doing there is it's sort of thresholding the the focal loss in our in our network. We're we're kind of thresholding that value, and then making a decision based on that uh, threshold setting. So. As a user, you could target it, right? So you could say, okay, I want it to go really sensitive and target the, the smallest of the small weeds, or I can uh, go less sensitive and only kind of care about the big weeds. And uh, what we found our customers doing was kind of using this in, in ways that we hadn't envisioned. And so one of those ways that, uh, that you know, was a total surprise, and I remember when I was talking to this, uh, you know, I, I spent a bunch of time out in the field this, this summer working with customers and observing their workflows. And when I came back and, and said, yeah, like one of the favorite things to do is to set this thing to be really low sensitivity and then go after only the biggest weeds. And, and my, my team's heads exploded. They're like, wow, they're doing it wrong. Like they, that's, that's wrong. They're missing weeds. And, and uh, it, it was an interesting one because uh, as the farmers explained it to me, it made a lot more sense. And so what happens with uh, with row crops is, you know, when you uh, when you have a, you know just kind of picture a bare field and then picture uh, putting these crops in in rows and then picture like the crop emerging, right? So in that in that uh, time when when you're actually uh, you know growing a say a soybean crop, um, you do want to target all the weeds because what'll happen is those weeds will compete with your crop and they'll compete for nutrients and it'll reduce your yield. So like going pretty aggressively after those weeds uh, in the early, you know, f- first post uh, we, we talk about pre and post. And so pre applications are uh, pre planting and post are like post planting. So the first time you get in um, after planting is really called, called your like first post pass, if you will. And it makes a lot of sense to be aggressive at that early time. But as the crop starts to grow, what happens is that, you know, the the crop, if you're successful, the crop will grow faster than the weeds. And because of the, the, the spacing of which they're planted, they'll actually start to canopy over. And at that point, um, then they've actually won largely, and this is, this is not, you know, a generally true statement, but it's almost generally true that largely, you know, your crop has won when it's canopied over. Interesting. Do you, do you have um, computer vision people on your team that uh, have deep knowledge about farming? I would think there that might be a low overlap um, set of knowledge. <laughs> yeah, it definitely is. Um uh, I guess that I have the most. Um, so I grew up in uh, in rural Saskatchewan, and we had a we had a small like uh, quarter section farm. So I, I think, uh, and I, I used to ride horses and stuff when when I was a kid. So I think I've probably like got the strongest farming background on the computer vision machine learning team. Um, but what we tell people is that hey, you know, you don't have to know a lot about farming uh, to come and work for us, and. What you do have to do, though, is not be afraid to go out to the field because we we believe like that's where we learn the most. And that's been part of kind of Blue River's uh, DNA, I think, uh, for forever, essentially, is that we we think like, OK, you could go and like talk about stuff on the whiteboard and you definitely should do that. 
but you need to reduce that idea to practice and get it into the field as fast as possible so that you can, you know, learn how, you know, you can blow up your assumptions basically. So uh, that's kind of like one of our, our, uh, you know, guiding principles, I guess, at Blue River. And so uh, one of my, uh, one of my friends, uh, he calls us, uh, we, we don't like to hire house cats. And uh, what that means is like, if you're the sort of person that just likes to kind of like sit in their office and work on their problem and, and not, not go out to the field, then, you know, this probably may not be the greatest place for you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, no farming knowledge required. But <laughs> nice. But I like it. Good customer empathy. I, I feel the same way with the, the weights and biases engineering team. Um, have, have there been any other surprises when you've taken these devices into the fields? Yeah, there was actually. So um, we we have this um, this. In, if you're sitting in the cab, uh, actually, you know the the cab of these these machines are just absolutely fantastic. So um, you know you hop in the cab, right, and you're you're sitting in this chair that feels like a fighter jet. And you know part of the allure of the fighter jet, right, is you've got this joystick that has all these buttons on it, and uh, the the self propelled sprayer is exactly the same, and and uh, without word of a lie, there's like on the order of like 24, 25 buttons on this joystick, and they all do something different. And so you know, it's it's really fun to get in this thing and like, wow, you know, this is really really cool. And so we also have a display that uh, that that you can see, and and there's a couple of displays. There's one that's kind of sitting here, and then one that's that's kind of up in the you know, uh, up, up more at your eye level. So there's two displays that you can look at and you can control the system through the displays. Um, when we uh, launched the product for customers, you know, we thought that the kind of the driving factor would be killing weeds, right? We said, hey, you know, everybody, all the feedback we've heard is that people want to control their weeds and that's the most important thing. And then savings would be kind of second on that list. So that's kind of how we... Uh, came into this into the season, and uh, you know certainly some farmers are like that, and uh, and I think initially when they started the machine, like when they started using the machine, that was their first concern: is like, okay, I'm going to go with high sensitivity, I'm going to kill all my weeds, so I get the same weed control as broadcast, and then any savings I get on that are are going to be a bonus, but you know I'm not I'm not actually going after savings, and what at least what I saw was that. Um, people's workflows kind of shifted when they realized that um, they could use this a little bit more like a scalpel, right? Instead of a, a sledgehammer. So if you've got the ability to go in and do sort of targeted delivery to um, to only the things that that you care about, then um, that changes your workflow. And uh, I think what I saw was that was most interesting is back to this display. Um, as you're going through the through the field, uh, it has something we call the applied rate map, which is a um, it's it's basically like a it's a geospatial map, um, and it shows you what the boom is doing uh, in real time. So you can actually see the sprays laid down on this map as you're going over it, and it's sort of like a real time uh, you know real time measurement of weed pressure, if you will. And I think what I was surprised by was that um, customers usually don't look at that display because it's really boring. If you're if you're just doing in you know a broadcast application, then the applied rate is always the same, and it's not really an interesting map other than like you know is a sprayer on or not. Um, but with C and spray, uh, it's it's actually a really interesting map because you can see um, the patches coming coming down on each uh, individual spray nozzle. And what I saw that was really cool was um, growers were looking at that map and then they were looking outside and saying, oh yeah, that makes sense. I know I have more weeds in this area of the field. And then they get to another area where it wasn't spraying as much. And, oh, you know, that makes sense. Uh, I know that, you know, this this area isn't as wet, so I don't have many as many weeds. So um, I think that was really interesting to to, because their eyes were just kind of glued to this real time, uh, um, mechanism to see, you know, what, what's, you know, what's my sprayer doing and what's my weed pressure like? And, and that was really cool to see, uh, see folks using that. And how much have your models improved? Like, it sounds like they're over a threshold where it's useful. Do, do you still feel like there's a ways to go in terms of the quality of detection? Yeah, that's, um, <clears throat> that's a great question. So, 
the the models have improved um, dramatically year over year. So, wow. uh, and that's mainly due to better data labeling. It's yeah. There's kind of two parts to that. Um, getting smarter with our labels and and labeling, uh, you know, labeling with a better workforce, which we talked about. Um, also, being more targeted in what we label and and really kind of preferring uh, quality over quantity. I think mm-hmm. when we when we sort of got into this, we uh, a few years ago, we we always had the back of our mind, you know, quantity is really important, and specifically diversity is important. Mm-hmm. And the way that we kind of approach this collection of diversity is to uh, try to collect data in every kind of growing condition we can get our hands on. So it's interesting to see how much different the ground looks, you know, when you're, when we're kind of talking about soybeans, we might have a picture in our minds of a, of a soybean on dark soil and, you know, a really pristine kind of computer vision environment that you could train a model on in 10 minutes and do something. And, and it turns out not to be true at all. Um, there are so many, uh, confounding factors, um, one sort of visually confounding factor that's really interesting is um, folks are really getting into uh, no-till um, planting. And <clears throat> no-till planting is exactly what it sounds like. You just sort of don't do the tillage step and you keep the, the cover crop that was there last year. So say, you know, let's say you're, you're rotating uh, co- uh, corn and soybean. You might, um, you know, grow corn this year. And then next year you plant soybeans, but you don't actually like till it under. You just like run your planter through the old dead corn, right? So you had all these like stalks sticking up and they're all dead. And then you've got some plants that are emerging that are alive and then you've got weeds. And, and so it's, it's almost like the most confusing, like uh, computer vision environment you could possibly imagine. <laughs> and, uh, and that makes it really hard. Right. And so we've, We've been working really hard on on beefing our models up to work in these different situations. Um, another really good one is just the soil color and the farming practices. Uh, you know, in uh, in countries like Brazil, um, they actually don't really plant on uh, thirty inch rows. They plant, you know, sometimes much much uh, denser than that, mm-hmm. and that means that you can't really put a sprayer between the rows anymore. So they actually drive like 45 degrees across the rows and, you know, kind of kill plants with, or run over plants um, with, with the sprayer. So that's another like uh, situation that our model has to handle uh, is uh, these different farming practices in, in different regions. I guess as an aside, but how do they then do other, don't they have always have to drive some machine over their, over their fields? Why would they put this within, why would they put them so close together that they can't, drive machines over the fields without squashing plants it's a a little bit of a mix of different uh different types of machines oh, so yeah in so, sometimes what we see is that the um the farming practices kind of in the u.s um someone described this to me as as like how, how would you build a factory right well what you do is you'd mechanize every part of the uh of the operation and you'd build machines that do this over and over and over again and and you can think of farming the same way, except the the basically the factory goes to the plants, not the other way around. Um, you know, excluding kind of vertical farming, which is a different thing. Um, so when you have uh, sort of like the the John Deere, you know, if you have a full John Deere stack for all this, then um, you don't really have this problem. Like you can, yeah, you can plant with the same with it as you know a compatible spacing with your uh, with your uh, your your planter and your weeder and, and your harvester are all sort of compatible. But when you mix and match and you don't have, uh, you know, you don't have that kind of end-to-end solution, then you, you sort of do end up into uh, an interesting uh, interesting uh, uh, area where you've you've got to make some uh, some decisions. And so um, Brazil is a special, uh, special climate too. It's a lot uh, more humid and, you know, they actually kind of grow year round, right? So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a really interesting one. And, and soybeans uh, in that kind of environment love to be way dense. Um, so, uh, but, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting one, but yeah, that's, that's one of the uh, challenges we have with uh, uh, computer vision of teaching your model to identify weeds really at any kind of orientation. Yeah. I'm seeing why this is a harder problem than I was imagining. These are really evocative examples. Does it ever happen that 
your model has like an escape valve or something, or like it has some sense that, you know what, this is too hard. Like I like red alert. Don't, I don't want to like touch any plants. Yeah, actually, um, we we have exactly this system, and um, it's how we uh, it's really how, in a nutshell how we respond to dust. So you can imagine that um, dust is a really complicated environment because uh, you know there's really two things working against you. Is number one, you know, it's almost impossible to get good quality labels on a dusty image because hey, if people can't if tell what what's in the image, then Uh, hey, it's going to be really hard to get a machine to do that too. So labels are tough to do. Um, But the other thing that that I like to uh, uh, talk about is uh, these models often, uh, and there's there's research, I think, to back this up. I'm trying to remember the name of the paper that came out, but um, it's, I think it's called like confidently incorrect. But um, these machine learning models can be um, very confidently incorrect. And so like right. just a kind of like really stupid example is, you know, if we have a elephant versus giraffe classifier and then you show it a rhino, right, it's going to be confidently incorrect um, and just kind of by definition, right? And so what we've done is we've actually trained uh we, we sort of have a architecture that's a little bit like the Tesla model where we've got this backbone and then these heads that do different things. And so we have this image quality head that uh, uh, tells us our dust probability. And um, we've trained it to really detect the presence of dust. And once that's above a certain threshold, then we say, ah, you know, probably the results from the model are, uh, are not to be trusted in this scenario. They're, you know, the model might be confidently incorrect um, and then what we do is we, we do, uh, uh, in, in our system, it's pretty easy. Um, we have what, what's called a fallback. So we fall back to broadcast. So the idea is like, you know, if you're not sure what it is in your model, you don't trust the results of the model because it's dusty, then you just turn the sprayer on. And uh, that way you make sure you're not missing weeds. Oh, interesting. So, so you're really doing multitask learning. Is that, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, we have a, a few other kind of image quality related heads that's uh, that's in our architecture, and um, yeah, we're always kind of thinking about adding uh, adding more. You know, as we as we discover situations that we need to uh, detect, like uh, you know, a, a good example is uh, um, implement occlusion. So if if part of the implement gets into the camera frame, mm-hmm. you know, we want to be able to detect that and uh, and you know, you doing that as, as a kind of a detection head off of a, you know, an encoder backbone is a, is a really very efficient way to do that um, because you don't pay much of a runtime. You know, I think I think we pay, a, I don't know, the numbers aren't quite in my head, but I think we pay like much less than a millisecond runtime for, uh, you know, doing a dust classification. And how frequently do you update these models? Like, can you update the model on one of these devices? W- would you do that? Yeah, we do uh, do that, and it it's really kind of uh, uh, it's going to be up to the farmer ultimately how uh, how often they update, and really what's going to dictate that is their connectivity. So some of the farmers that we worked with, um, you know, had really good connectivity, and we could push updates to the machine um, very frequently if we wanted to. And other farmers that we worked with, you know, they're they're in very remote areas of sort of uh, you know West Texas, and and there are no bars. You know, you have to go 20, 30 miles away before you get uh, like one four G bar. Mm-hmm. And you know, those. I think what's going to happen is we're going to see that the the folks that have connectivity are going to be updating more often, and they're going to be getting like kind of the latest and the greatest models. Um, the folks that are not are uh, are, are going to be just you know updating much much less often. And are you able to use the data that the cameras collect in the fields to improve the models? Yeah, yeah, we do that. So just like every other uh, you know company that has a bunch of sensors, you you quickly figure out like okay, well we can't record all the time, and so. Our solution to this is that we uh, we do some sort of like very sparse triggered recording as uh, folks are going through the field within minutes of them going through the field, you know, uh, subject to the connectivity constraint that I talked about. Um, the machines are uploading data uh, so that we can uh, validate the performance of that data. And um, we like to think of this sort of like ML flywheel concept 
right? Where uh, I think Andrew Ng calls this kind of like the, the virtuous cycle of AI, where you train a model, you know, it does some predictions, you evaluate those predictions, you know, train more models and and your your model gets better and better. And so we have folks sign a sort of a data use agreement that allows us to do this. But uh, this data is a goldmine for us in terms of finding edge conditions in the model. And, uh, you know, when you're training machine learning models, you kind of like quickly start breaking champagne, you know, after you get X number of model of images in the model, because, you know, you're, you're sort of like getting to this point of diminishing returns pretty fast. But that doesn't mean your model is working well. That means your model is generally okay, but it might actually really suck in some situations, right? And so what our metric is, is, is how many fields are you actually passing our spec on, right? Instead of, uh, you know, instead of aggregating all fields together into a single number, we break them out on a per field basis. And our goal is to always drive that number higher. And so it, it really comes to kind of into exception management where you've, you know, you very quickly kind of reach this, this point where uh, the model is actually doing pretty well, but then it has like these notable failures. And now your attention shifts to addressing, well, detecting and then addressing these failures. And, and that's what the uh, ultra sparse logging helps us to do because we, uh, we can really just get the data from the, from the customers, you know, in the fields they're actually trying to work on and we can improve their models. So you guys are really doing a hard real world application of ML on massive data sizes, and you've been doing it for long enough to really be battle hardened, I, I guess. So I'm I'm really <laughs> dying to know, like what what does your ML stack look like, and and how did you get to it? Like like how did you decide on like your ML framework? What are the other tools that are really important to you? Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Oh yeah, sure. It's it's been a, a really kind of a fun journey. Um, kind of going back to 2016, you know, we were training our first models in Cafe because that was the you know nobody's heard of Cafe these days, but boy, that was like the the tool that everybody used um, back in 2016. It was way farther ahead than say TensorFlow at the time. Um, so yeah, we started with Cafe and we built a system out in Cafe, and then. We saw some interesting things going with TensorFlow, and uh, you know, I, I suspect this will be kind of a familiar story to a lot of your, hopefully, a lot of your <laughs> listeners. Um, we we moved to TensorFlow in sort of 2018, and uh, then we saw, hey, you know, PyTorch is getting really interesting. So we moved to PyTorch um, about a year ago, and so we've been we've been doing most of our work in uh, in PyTorch now. What caused you to move from TensorFlow to PyTorch? Was it like a feature that that mattered? What was the the driving reason it was um really adoption so the we we found like the the uh uh now this sort of our our experience with tensorflow was really before the eager interface um you know and and so yeah so prior to eager so this is more than a year ago probably right yeah yeah i think it was like 2018 when we were we were doing uh pytorch uh um yeah and so it was really before the eager interface and our our, our folks are finding like, you know, it, it follows the papers a little bit too, right? Mm -hmm. So um, when folks write a lot of papers and there's, you know, if you go to papers with code and you can download the PyTorch thing, you know, that's that's like just like a much lower startup cost, right? So yeah. um, to some sense, it follows that. Mm. Interesting. And, and what else? Like, do you guys do hyperparameter optimization? Is that important to you? Do you use like a data store for this? What, what are you using? Yeah, we um, so in terms of our training stack, um, you know, PyTorch is kind of our main tool. Um, we have done a little bit of uh, hyperparameter search. We, you know, one of the things that's a big challenge for us is that, um, you know, at some level we're stuck between this like rock and a hard place. And the rock is the accuracy, you know, we want the highest accuracy. Uh, but the hard place is also we need to make this run as fast as possible. So in our system, the speed at which the the uh, the farmer could drive the uh, drive the machine is derated, you know, directly gated by how fast our inference goes. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, we have to take great pains to you know try to pick an engineer and network architecture that's going to uh, you know satisfy our accuracy but run in the in the time constraints. That we need. 
And so that actually kind of dictates a lot of our, you know, network ar- architecture choices. And in terms of our kind of deployment stack, um, what we, you know, oh, so back to hyperparameters. So, so that what that means is that we we actually don't have a tremendous number of hyperparameters to search for. It's really just sort of learning rate, learning rate scheduler, uh, you know, and a handful of other things. But we're we're sort of like by definition almost not our, our search space and architecture isn't uh, isn't very large. So some of the things that you would normally do with hyperparameters, uh, we we haven't found them to be all that useful for our our uh, problem. Can I ask a, this is just, just came to me, but, but it seems like a self-driving car is hard, but a self-driving tractor might be pretty easy, especially if someone's just looking at a console instead of the field. Why does a human have to drive the tractor if you can do these really smart things to figure out where the weeds are? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're right on the money there, Lucas, as, as usual. Um, if you think about like, what are the challenges of, of, a uh, uh auto driving car and they're they're really large right but like just to pick one example you know let's say you're you're cruising along the freeway and it, you're going 100 kilo, you know 100 kilometers an hour i'm from canada so that's <laughs> why i think of kilometers so um you know you're going 100 kilometers an hour and then something happens and you you need to slam on the brakes right like is that the right thing to do on the freeway? And the answer is, well, maybe, I don't know. It depends what the problem is <laughs> right. um, with, uh, you know, tractor automation, right? It's actually fine because, you know, your field isn't full of tractors going hundred kilometers an hour and nobody's going to like sideswipe you with another tractor. Right. And like, if, if you see something weird, you could just stop and it's totally fine. Right. So, you know, yeah, you're right on the money. It's uh it's a lot and it's geofenced, right? So you, you could say, okay, well, I'm just going to, you know, allow myself to be automated in this area. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, de- yeah, definitely a lot of, uh, advantages, um, in, in terms of like our, our, you know, problem space for automation, you know, huge number of advantages. And is that something that you might work on or? You did see that uh, John Deere uh, um, acquired uh, Bear Flag recently, so um, you know I think you can uh, probably guess that uh, John Deere is very interested on this in this, and I, I think some more information will be coming. Awesome. Are there any um, other farming applications that you're really excited about? Yeah, you know we uh, we view weeding as kind of like the uh, the almost the beachhead project, right? And um, I think what, uh, you know, I've got a, a background in astronomy. So the, this metaphor kind of makes sense to me of like, when you build a new telescope that, you know, has maybe different modalities or a different resolution, all of a sudden you get this data from this new telescope and then you start answering questions you never even thought to ask before. And uh, I, I kind of feel like the same thing's going to happen with our system. The fact that you have, uh, you know, cameras that are three feet away from plants taking you know, pictures at a high rate of speed and high resolution pictures is really going to open our eyes and, and change the things that, that we're doing with the data, right? So you can actually see the weeds evolve uh, as you spray them. So you can go in today, you know, do, do your sprays. You can look at that map and say, okay, you know, um, where, did I, where did I actually uh, spray the most and which weeds am I concerned about? And you can plan your next workflow based on that data. Cool. Well, we always end with two open-ended questions, and and one doesn't necessarily even need to be about farming. It's it's kind of your take on what's a topic in machine learning that you think is underappreciated, or something that you'd like to dig more into if you had more time in your life. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I did put a little bit of thought on on this one, so. I think like a really underrated aspect of machine learning. Uh, there was a paper in, uh, I think it was 2013. Uh, it was called Technical Debt in Machine Learning Systems. Oh, yeah. It was by uh, Google, Google, right? Yeah, yeah. You, you know this paper, yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, the thing that really jumped out to me on this paper is uh, when you think about like the whole machine learning pipeline, sort of like 20% of it is the, you know, the the cool, sexy stuff that everybody wants to do and, you know, network design and uh, hyperparameters and and all that fun stuff, you know, training on thousands of GPUs, right? Um, that's all fun and very necessary, but it's about sort of 20% of the problem. And 
really, if you don't have a really strong data infrastructure around that, then you actually can't do that that uh, that part that the twenty percent part. So you can't make your product. So having like a an excellent data pipeline, I think, is kind of under underrated, and it's it's something that everybody kind of I think underestimates when they get into machine learning. It's like okay, all I got to do is like take this this TensorFlow tutorial and do MNIST, and okay, awesome. Like now I'll just like fine tune a model, and I'm off to the races, and. Uh, you know, if you've got a like an awesome data pipeline, then that's kind of largely true. But if you don't, then like you got to focus your efforts on like building that data pipeline because that's really a, a I think like probably the most underrated uh, problem in uh, in sort of building ML systems in in my mind. Do you have any specific suggestions for someone putting together a data pipeline from approach to even what software they might look at first? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'll, I'll kind of draw a parallel to labeling. So in in uh, 2016, you know, we wanted to do labeling on images, and uh, we we couldn't really uh, find what we what we wanted. So we we kind of had to build our own system based on MTurk to do that, and and that made sense at the time because like we couldn't sort of like look at the marketplace and pick the thing that looked good and then go with it, right? Um, and then sort of in 2018, well, we said, okay, well, this exists now, so we can just do this. <laughs> and, and that's kind of how we met you with, uh, with your old company. And, and so I think like uh, what I'm seeing is like the startup world is a fire with ML ops solutions, right? So, so folks have figured out like, wow, you know, these problems are hard and they're, they're hairy and they're nasty. And I would sort of encourage folks when they're looking at data pipeline to yeah survey the the uh, the the space you know there's there's sort of like new offerings kind of every day out out there right and uh, I think you you'd be doing yourself a disservice if you didn't at least evaluate them before you embark on your data pipeline journey I I don't know that it, like there's a solution out there that's going to do everything that you want. But there could be something that gets you pretty far, and then you can add your own plugins or or uh, or something to that effect, right? But uh, I would say, like, yeah, if you're if you're sort of like clean slate, you know, how do I get started? Well, you should definitely look at some of the software packages that are out there because um, this is not really a problem that you necessarily want to solve unless you absolutely have to. <laughs> Well, as someone that makes one of these software packages, I strongly agree with that. <laughs> <sort of it. laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Um, I guess that's a good segue to our final question, which is, and, and you guys have had one of the, I think the longest journeys of sort of like imagining a solution and then actually getting it like working in production. I mean, what's it been like eight, eight or nine years maybe to, to, for that full um, cycle, I guess, where have the, where have the biggest bottlenecks or the most surprising bottlenecks been? Yeah, that's a really, uh, that's a deep one for sure. So uh, Blue River's kind of first computer vision product was uh, the lettuce, uh, lettuce thinning machine. And uh, that kind of operated from, you know, 20, 2013 to 2016 uh, in the Salinas Valley in Yuma, Arizona. And, um, then we kind of pivoted to do uh, row crops. So the it's kind of when I got involved in the company is uh, 2016, uh, working on row crops, and and so yeah, our journey has kind of been from you know 2016 to to roughly now. And um, the things that are really I think hard is when you're when you're talking about uh, uh, building a piece of hardware uh, and a piece of software and and ML that work together, right? That's a really, really hard thing to do, um, and I, I think there's a there's definitely a huge difference between kind of building like being really scrappy and building a prototype that is going to work out in the field and get customer feedback. That is a tremendously different proposition from you know scaling these things out to thousands of machines. Uh, you know, with John Deere, right? That's a that's a huge jump, and so. Uh, I think that's kind of like scaling, and I, you know, I, I was looking at a book the other uh, just yesterday, written by Reed Nelson. I think it, the title was uh, "Scaling," <laughs> and you know, scale achieving scale is really, uh, uh, really a big challenge. And I think it's even more complicated when you've got kind of hardware in the loop because 
Now, instead of just having the software portion or just the ML portion, now you've actually got um, hardware, which you know necessarily takes a, a much longer cycle time to uh, improve or or fix. So uh, I think the, that's just been I think the biggest challenge is uh, is marrying the two, you know, software and the hardware together, and and uh, getting something that that drives customer value. That's been the I think the biggest uh, you know biggest uh, challenge for sure. Well, congratulations on making such an amazing product that helps farmers and helps the world. It's a uh, great to talk to you about it. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, you know, we we definitely are excited uh, by this product. And what I'm personally really excited about is as we scale this thing out to you know tens of machines and hundreds of machines and thousands of machines, those savings are going to go proportionally. And uh, I've been at, talking to John Deere about this. Uh, I want to get a uh, savings, gallons of herbicide saved on the John Deere website. And it's going to just like keep increasing, going like to this really big number. And it's going to be like the national debt, but it'll be like a good number. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, even when that happens, I'll uh, I'll take a look and feel a little bit of pride yeah, there too. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the link. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for your time. Okay. Thanks, Lucas. Take care. If you're enjoying these interviews and you want to learn more, please click on the link to the show notes in the description where you can find links to all the papers that are mentioned, supplemental material, and a transcription that we work really hard to produce. So check it out. I guess this doesn't have much to do with machine learning, but it's my podcast. So I'm going to ask it anyway. If you, um, <laughs> if, if there was a, a transporter, like a Star Trek style transporter that would like disintegrate your body and rematerialize it somewhere else, does that seem like a safe thing to use? Like, would you get into that and, and use it to transport yourself? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Um, so here's the answer I'd love to tell you is like, oh, yeah, awesome. That would be amazing. But yeah, I would never get into that. Just like I would never jump out of a plane. Mm. You know, sometimes you learn things about yourself and, and they're just, you know, the fact is that, yeah, I'm not going to jump out of a plane. And uh, I think I'm not going to be an early adopter of the uh, of the Starship transporter, right? So, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, to, two answers. <laughs> would you be a late adopter? Like if everyone else was using it, do you think that would convince you? I think so, yeah. I, I definitely think I would be, uh, you know, it, it would be, have so many advantages, right, that I, I think it would be almost irresistible to... Uh, to not not to not to use it right so but yeah I, I i don't see myself as like one of the first people uh jumping into the transporter um but uh <laughs> certainly uh you know it, it would it would save us so much time and like we could we could just uh you know get to london for a meeting like that and then come back right that would be super awesome <laughs> you wouldn't be concerned though that it's like a different person who shows up in london even though they act like you and look like you <laughs> Yeah, well, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I haven't, uh, it's been a while since I've been, re you know, I, I used to do a fair amount of quantum physics and I, I, uh, I haven't done a lot, you know, very much lately in my current job. But uh, as far as I can remember, uh, you know, there's, there's not really a, a bound on how your molecules get reassociated, right? And there's definitely uh, entropy and energy loss in that process. So, you know, I, I think there are definitely some challenges for sure, uh, you know, and, and we'll, we'll have to see, you know, well, there'll, there'll definitely be a good test. Like maybe you have to, you know, pass some kind of a test when you get out of the transporter to see if you're still you. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Um, okay. Here's another, another sort of um, fun one that we've been asking guests is, uh, I mean, what do you, what do you think about the singularity? Like, do you imagine a world where ML gets smarter than us in, in kind of every way and, um, we just stop working. Does that does that seem likely or unlikely to you? Oh yeah, that's a, such a great question. I think my thoughts on this uh, have been, uh, you know, kind of formed by like the Minsky school of thought um, to some extent, and it's it's interesting that uh, as we get into like a more connected society, right? Like you can you can kind of think of intelligence as these nodes that are connected, right? And in information gets shared between the nodes. And I think like one thing that's sort of really interesting about that is that as we put more and more nodes into the network, uh, you know, whether it be sort of Facebook or social media or a computer, as we add more and more nodes, you know, we're, we're actually not seeing intelligence 
um, emerge out of that. We're in some sense, in some of the social media sites, we're seeing the opposite, right? The, sort of like an anti-intelligence almost emerging. Um, and it, it is sort of a like a, a really interesting thing because I don't think anything anyone would have predicted that sort of 10 years ago that, you know, we'd be having these problems all of a sudden when you, when you uh, you know, put everybody in communication, we have all these all these problems that kind of popped out of that, right? I don't think anybody would have predicted that. Certainly I didn't. Um, in terms of like, you know, a, a sentient computer that's that's going to take over everything, um, I think we're a ways away from that. The, you know, is it a possibility in the future? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, how close are we to that? You know, it's it's pretty tough to say. I, I know that um, with training, you know, computer vision models, um, these things are pretty far from like uh, AGI, right? There's the the teams that I work with and and the the folks that, that I interact with are under no illusions that uh, that this thing is anything other than a, uh, a specially trained model to do a certain uh, certain task, right? So they're nowhere close to what I would sort of describe as AGI. So I I do think that uh, we have a long way to go before we we really have to worry about um, you know a Skynet sort of thing taking over the over the uh, <laughs> over the world. I, I don't think we're anywhere close to that uh, by any means.